Hey guys, this is Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN, and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. The ML Sports Platter, back with you. Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, Deezer, anywhere else you get your podcast on your smartphone device. Look for that little icon, depending on your phone. If it's an Apple phone, you look for the purple podcast button, and of course, hit it. Hit search, ML Sports Platter, subscribe, five-star reviews, and feedback are all appreciated. You can hit me on Twitter, at Mike L Sports, the podcast under the umbrella of the Brawl Network, and hit us on Twitter as well, at Network Brawl. This podcast is presented by our great friends over at Rosie's Corner, pizza, pasta, hot and cold subs, and more. If you're in and around Central New York, get on over to Rosie's Corner. They've got the themed food days as well, like your Fish Friday, Chicken and Biscuit Wednesday, and Meatloaf Monday. It is Rosie's Corner, a proud ML Sports Platter sponsor, available on Grubhub as well. In addition, we are presented by Stanley Law Offices, Bryant and Stratton College, and Axe Exotic Pets, Route 11 Cicero. Terrific place for your specialized snakes, lizards, birds, and much more. They've got awesome aquariums there as well. Cannot wait to chat with our next guest. You can get him on Twitter, at Ryan D. Leaf. He is the host of the Believe in the Pac-12 podcast, a part of the Believe Podcast's umbrella. He's obviously come back from all kinds of adversity. His story is amazing, what he's doing for people right now, helping with mental health, helping uh, players, non-players, etc., uh, talking about his experience. Um, it, it's just remarkable uh, where he was and where he is now, uh, where he was and then where he was even before that as one of the most heralded prospects ever in college football history going neck and neck with Peyton Manning. Uh, and then obviously everything coming crashing down. Now he's risen back up and he's going to tell us his story right here on the ML Sports Platter. Ryan Leaf, thank you so much for doing this. How are you? I'm doing real well. Thanks for having me. Well, it's just a a pleasure to have you. Um, I've heard so many of your interviews with so many people on so many shows, so it's (laughs) awfully hard for me to be like, hey, let me kind of create some question that I'm going to get an answer. Maybe that Ryan Leaf is going to give you a break new. It's going to be impossible for me. So I want to start the interview this way. Being Coming from where you were, you started with the highs and the football and the top quarterback and the prospect and and then whoosh down and all the way back up now and you've got this life now and you're helping people. Where's Ryan Leaf in 10 years? Uh, you know, I don't do that. I don't look at, I don't look at ahead at anything. I, I look at, uh, you know, what the rest of the day has for me and that's, that's served me well the last, you know, almost nine years. So that's been uh, a part of your healing? Well, it is. I just live day by day. You know, it's just one day at a time. I really, I really subscribe to that, and and it, it's changed my life. So I, you know, I hope I'm in, in exactly the same spot uh, ten years from now. A, a grateful, recovering, uh, you know, drug addict, uh, a guy that uh, is a, a good father, and uh, uh, somebody who works really hard at, at the job that he's that he's working at the time that's that's what I hope 10 years from now looks like because all of those you know defining markers for me would be completely 180 degrees different than who I was you know nine years ago um football wise you know you, you hear a lot of times guys play it but they don't love it have you have you did you love it did you hate it were you somewhere in between did it all happen at different times I loved it all the time. I've, lo- I've loved it from the moment I could pick up a football or yeah. a ball, or I just love to compete. Now, of course, you know I hated going into work there at, at the end because I was dealing with mental illness and depression and, and things like that. So, and I think for the first few year, years after being out of the league, I, I saw it as something very toxic, but so great to be back part of it again. Um, you know, it gave me everything. Uh, and it's it's fun to be able to be you know kind of on the analyst side of it. It feels like I'm you know um, especially when I call games on the weekends, preparing all week, watching film, doing the fun stuff. It you know it it brings me right back to it. And as one of my one of my bosses at ESPN told me, they said I you know Ryan, you've forgotten more football than than most people know. So it's 
there's truth in that. You know, it's just been part of my life for so long. When you were at your best playing the quarterback position, what did it feel like? Um, well, it's just, just it's incredible fun, uh, and, and you feel like you know you feel like everything really comes easy, and you just seen stuff really well. And one of the be- biggest things, and I think a lot of people say this a lot, things just slow down. It almost seems like, hmm. especially defensively, uh, it looks like things are kind of moving in slow motion. That's when you are the best. That's when you are seeing things um, the clearest, and it's usually when you're most effective. So you obviously are, are covering the, the Pac-12, doing an awesome job on the on the Believe in the Pac-12 podcast, part of the Believe podcast umbrella. A lot of people think the Pac-12, you know, is is way behind a lot of the other Power Fives, and they they need a lot of work, and people don't catch their games, and they've tried to change times and all this sort of stuff, and a lot of it centers around USC. Is is it as simple as just saying, hey? If you get the behemoth, if you get the uh, almost that football blue blood back in the Trojans, the Pac-12 comes back instantly. Is it that simple? No, well, they just need a, they just need an elite team. It doesn't matter if it's Who the cares? Trojans or okay. not. It can, it, it can be the Oregon Ducks. It can be the Stanford Cardinal. It can be the Washington Huskies. It can be anybody. If 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 you have an elite team that goes undefeated and plays in the college football playoff, then you, you're back in the mix. The problem is, is the Pac-12 is just. Um, Uber competitive from top to bottom. Any team can win on any given weekend, and that just isn't the case in the big in the Big Ten right now, or the SEC, or the ACC. It's Alabama, it's Clemson, it's Ohio State, and then you throw in the possibility of a few other teams: LSU one year, Georgia one year, Oklahoma uh, from time to time. You know, it's it's that's what it is. Uh, but the ACC is 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 not a good conference. They have an elite team. You know, the SEC isn't necessarily a great conference. They have Alabama, right? And Ohio State, not necessarily a great conference in the Big Ten, but Ohio State's been the dominant force. So if if the Pac-12 had that, there would be more of a storyline. But I like that it's competitive. I like every Saturday not knowing who's going to win the game in the Pac-12. Now, would I want our conference to be part of the conversation when you're talking about the national championship? Yes, of course. That's why I'm hoping and praying that the committee – starts to make movement on the expansion and allows for more teams to get in. And not just because it still won't be Alabama and Clemson or Alabama and Ohio State for the national championship, but because more of the fan bases around the country will stick around. Because I swear people are jumping off this ship when you're only allowing four and you already know who three of them are going to be. Ryan Leaf with us at Ryan D. Leaf on Twitter. Catch and believe in the Pac-12 podcast, of course, Sirius XM, college football and NFL Analyst work in the RDL show on YouTube, and of course, get all the handles on Twitter and make sure you subscribe to all of the podcast uh, information. They're great content, and the YouTube channel. Uh, Ryan, when you were going through, you know, the time in in jail, and you're, I guess, somewhat of rock bottom as daily at, at, at some point. It was maybe a point where you were saying, "Geez, I don't know if I can get out of this thing." Um, did, did you try different things every day mentally? Did you ask people different things as days went on? If it didn't get better, like how, how much did you try to change a routine, so to speak, just to kind of try to get in another direction? If I'm making sense. Uh, None at all. Uh, Prison is not a deterrent. Prison is a, uh, is the suburbs for criminals is what it is. Um, it's it's you know it's the reason why we're the most heavily populated uh, prison population in, in the world. Um, it's all it is. It's not going to change you. I did nothing. I sat on my butt. Uh, I watched you know I had a little thirteen inch flat screen at the end of my bed with the NFL Red Zone on Sundays. It's it's like I said. It's not a deterrent. It's not something that's going to change your 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 point of view or your perspective, you have to do that. You have to ultimately figure that out on your own because no one's going to help you do it. And everybody in there is the worst possible version of of themselves. You've made a pretty flawless transition into media and obviously you're really well-spoken, great communicator. Seems like you're really loving it. How are you having fun every day? Yeah, I enjoy it. I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, for the longest time I got to, you know, practice and play football for a living to make a really good living and now you know I I get to talk about the things that I truly enjoy and that's you know all kinds of sports when it comes to 
football, basketball, baseball, hockey, all of it. I you know enjoy all of it. Now that's what I get to do on a daily basis as an occupation to not only support me but my family and everything like that. I mean, how how could you not be grateful for that? Uh, I'm really uh, I don't take any of it for granted. I know I'm really really blessed, and I think that allows me to to uh, really think about others and and what I do in my spare time on how I give back. I, I really really do. So you're born in Montana, you go to high school in Montana, you go to Washington State, but you know, when you're when you're a little boy, when you're playing, you know, Pee Wee football, you're in the you're in the Pop Warners, you're you're growing up watching the game, the college game, the pro game. Uh who were some of your favorite football players when you were a youngster, Ryan? Well, Terry Bradshaw was my hero. I was a diehard Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Um and then uh in baseball i was a cub i was a cubbies uh fan brian sandberg was my was my guy i, I thought i was going to grow up and play shortstop and turn two with brian sandberg uh in chicago so you know being in montana we don't have a, we don't have a, a pro team yeah. so we had to you know pluck them from around the country and WGN played in my in my hometown, so we saw the Cubs a ton, and I just I, I fell in love with them. On the basketball side of things, it was the Supersonics. I was a huge Gary Payton and Sean Kemp, <laughs> George Carl fan. So, you know, you know my 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 um, you know likes uh, spread all the way around. But Terry Bradshaw at the very beginning of it all was was my hero. The uh, um, the black and yellow of 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 Pittsburgh and the steel curtain and that defense and all that stuff. So that's definitely the team that I, that I looked up to. And uh, looking back now, I wish I could have played for a couple more quick ones for Ryan leaf here on the ML sports platter. Um, what have you learned from Peyton Manning through the years? And what do you think he's learned from you? Oh, I don't know if he's learned much from me. He probably learned what not to do uh, for me, but I don't think that was ever really a problem on his end. He was uh, really, really prepared well for for how to deal with failure, uh, how to overcome, how to outlast, outlast adversity, and be a, a great leader. I think I I learned. Uh, I think I really learned humility from from Peyton Manning. Um, I I never, you know, for as confident in some of the stories we hear of, of how confident he was and everything like that. I don't feel like we really ever got that feeling from him, um, you know, publicly, right? He, he just always seemed like a likable person. And then he always stayed in touch with me, even though I was going through some of the hardest, you know, times of my life. He was always a connection to to the sports world and, and to have one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play still acknowledge you as, as a human being, I think, is huge. So, um he, he's been a meaningful. Um, he's been a meaningful person in my life for the last, you know, twenty-two years, and I, I you know, I, I feel I probably feel like our relationship is much closer than he does, you know. But uh, it's nice when he gets elected into the Hall of Fame, and I send him a text uh, congratulating him, and, and and I get one back in the same night. I mean, I'm sure his phone was blowing up from everybody and everyone uh, congratulating him. So I just. You know, it's neat to see uh, somebody that's such a good person, um, you know, combination with also being a great, outstanding football player. What are these guys up against? Justin Fields, Trey Lance, Trevor Lawrence, uh, Zach Wilson. The, the, you know, when you're a, a highly touted prospect like this, a top five type NFL quarterback, the premier position, the most important position in sports, as we know, you went through it, the whirlwind going into the NFL draft. What What is this time like for these guys? What's the draft like? How, how nerve-wracking is it? Well, you know, it wasn't incredibly nerve-wracking for me and Peyton because we knew we were going to be the first or second pick. So, you know, that there was no, you know, what if. Now, these guys, you know, tend to each and every year uh, get thought of – in terms of an accordion, they could be the first pick all the way to the, you know, 32nd pick. Who knows what, how that's going to drop, how you're going to fit. So they're, they have to worry about that, but they also have to have to have some perspective around the idea that, you know, when they feel like they have all this pressure and all this stress, it's not necessarily real. It's, it's a projection from the public, from the media, um, from people who are telling you, what you're about to go do is so much more important than anything else. Like if, if you went off and, and played for two years, say if Justin Fields went out and played for two years uh, and then was out of the league, um, that would be okay. 
uh, you know, life would go on and he would be extremely successful in whatever his next venture in life would be. Um, I think we get caught up too much in the importance of these, what people consider can't miss prospects and, uh, and that it's on them to understand that it's, you know, it's not the most important thing in the world you do. You know, you being a human being is the most important thing you'll ever do in this world. And if you can f- keep that in perspective, um, guys have an easier time adjusting and making that transition to the NFL. In the minute I have left with you, Ryan, can you just promote anything you'd like to promote uh, where people can help donate, uh, you know, the recovery communities, um, where they are, how to get involved, websites, anything you want to promote that you're doing uh, in helping others uh, have the floor here? Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, we, uh, we do a lot of work in the, in the mental health and, and substance abuse uh, um, uh, areas and um, – my website is the Ryan D leaf.com T T H E Ryan D leaf.com. And you can find out so much more about our foundation, uh, about what we do to give back, how I impact communities all over the country with speaking engagements. And then of course, my work on Sirius XM, as well as the bleed podcast network. Um, I launched my own, uh, kind of sports entertainment show, uh, this week. We, we launched it on Monday. It's a, uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, the show's called The Ryan D. Lee Show or, or The RDL Show, and uh, we've, we've had two episodes so far, and I think it's going really well. It's, it's, a, different, it's a different show. It's a it's sports talk show, of course, related, but it's, you know, it's me. It's, I'm the one involved, so I believe that sports brings everybody together so that you can have uh, the real open and honest conversations and and I think that's what we've done the first uh, first couple of shows. So every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, noon Pacific live until one Pacific uh, on on YouTube, and uh, you can catch the audio podcast uh, on any of your podcast platforms that you that you get your podcasts on. Heisman Trophy finalist, nineteen ninety seven, the Pac ten Offensive Player of the Year in nineteen ninety seven, same year first team All American. That was a pretty good year in nineteen ninety seven. Now doing unbelievable work, breaking down college football, the NFL, Sirius XM. Uh, get them on uh, YouTube and, and subscribe to the Believe in Pac-12 podcast, uh, all a part of the Believe podcast uh, umbrella. And, of course, the RyanDLeaf.com website is a must-visit as well. At Ryan D. Leaf on Twitter. Ryan Leaf, thank you so much. Continued success, and I'm glad you're okay. You bet. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. Coming up next on the ML Sports Platter, I'm going to give you my top 10 baseball players as we head into 2021. This is the ML Sports Platter, all a part of the Brawl Network. Back with you here, ML Sports Platter, all over the major platforms. Google, Spotify, Stitcher, Deezer, Apple, you name it. Download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review. And oh, by the way, don't forget... If you're having trouble trying to figure out how to subscribe and download, you're just kind of clicking on links on social media, the easiest way to get my podcast, to get all of our podcasts, is to just hit that subscribe button. Basically, for example, for an Apple phone, just find that purple podcast icon button, tap it, hit search, type in ML Sports Platter, hit subscribe, five-star reviews and feedback, and guess what? They come right to your phone like pieces of mail. So make sure you download and subscribe to the podcast here as a part of the Brawl Network on Twitter at Network Brawl. And I'm also hosting uh, at Bills Brawl for Buffalo Bills content, NFL information. And of course, you can hit me on Twitter at Mike L Sports. So I got into this uh, a a few nights ago as I was kind of surfing through some previews and I'm through uh, probably a division and a half. I plan to read the rest of my baseball preview this weekend. Um, you know, and again, I'm not really rah-rah about the season uh, as much as I have been in years past because I just think that the, you know, the analytics and the launch angle and the BS and cutting the front offices and, you know, the farm systems, um, you know, getting whacked and Rob Manfred's a moron and, uh, you know, the product is not as good and uh, they don't market their sport. I mean, I could go on and on. Everybody knows all the problems with Major League Baseball, but I thought it'd be kind of cool to do a top 10 player list. I, I, I think that a lot of people out there, you know, they make their list, and I, I kind of was Googling and searching some, you know, for top 50, top 10, top 100, and a lot of people include pitchers. 
And before I give my top 10 list, I just want to kind of, and if you've listened to me for years, you know that this is how I operate, but I, I have to separate in hockey, goalies, and then all the other players because they play such a distinct position, goalies, and the same applies for pitching. Pitchers and goalies are very similar. They're the most important spot in their sport. But as far as comparing them to other, like, player-player, you know, where the game, I don't think, is controlled as much, especially in baseball because, you know, the defense has the ball, <laughs> right? The pitcher has the ball. The pitcher dictates everything until that ball goes into play for the other players. And then players are players are players. Like, they hit, they play every day. There's just a huge difference between pitchers and, and, and regular day players. Same goes for goalie and, you know, the, the mix of defensemen and forwards. So I always have to throw that out there. Um, so right off the bat, when I was putting this list together and I started adding the names of Yelich and Tatis and Bregman and Freeman and Acuna and Betts and Trout, right? I started going, isn't this unbelievable? There's no New York Yankee in here right away, like jumping off the page. I mean, the New York Yankees, like over $200 million in payroll every single year. I know that's what everybody loves to talk about, but you still have to be smart with your payroll. But like, they're, they're the New York Yankees. I mean, they have 40 pennants. They have 27 world championships. They're in the playoffs every year. They have the most resources. They have, you know, international scouting and all the rest. They've got the longest tenured general manager. Usually, if you put together a top 10 list, there's a Yankee in there, a player, right? You put together a top five, to 10 pitchers list over the course of 15, 20 years during the Tory era, you'd have to put one of those guys in there. You, I mean, you'd have to, whether it was Roger Clemens after, you know, he peaked in Toronto, probably using steroids, of course, along the way. But, you know, Clemens then or, or Pettit in 96 or, you know, I mean, top players on on the Yankees in 2009. You know, I mean, you'd have to put Alex Rodriguez in there at some point, maybe multiple times, depending on the year. Uh, or years. So, um, but this year, I, I, I think that if you're going to put a Yankee in the top 10, I, I, and, and, and if he gets in there and squeezes in there, it would be DJ LeMahieu. So I, I've had a really hard time with this list because I, I, I created the first 10 and then I knocked a couple out and then I added a couple in and then I switched a couple guys around. And I'm just going to go like from one to ten here. Um, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll go. I'll go ten to one. That that way it'll be a little bit more of a suspenseful uh, thing for you listening. Now, listen. Here's one thing to remember with this. Um, this is not past accolades. This is not well. Christian Yelich won an MVP. Just re- we're talking about this second going into 2021, with how the player is right now. The most recent production, like recent, recent production is in like last back end of maybe last year. Uh, you know, the shape that they're in right now, the expectations of this year, all that stuff goes into like this second. It's not like, well, look what this player did in 2017 or 18. It's it's the here and right now, right? And I got to tell you, this was really, really hard. I'm just the outside looking in, not in my top 10. I have... My two guy, I picked two guys just outside the top 10, and it's Christian Yelich at 12 and DJ LeMahieu at 11, just missing the cut. Now, look, LeMahieu, amazing hitter, super versatile, amazing vacuum with a glove. But that just goes to show you how the young man's game is between the age of 19, 20, and about 25, 26 in this game that there's actually 10 guys I would put ahead of him. I still think he's the best player on the Yankees. I think he's a top 12, 15-ish type player in Major League Baseball. But cracking a top 10, I've got him just on the outside. And I could have easily put him in the top 10. I mean, I think you could argue with with him being in there without a doubt. But I'll explain why all these guys have a little bit of a smidge ahead of him. But the versatility, the glove work, and obviously him being an outstanding hitter, hitting it everywhere, almost got him into the top 10. So my 10th best player in baseball, I got Nolan Arenado, who... Uh, has himself a new home in St. Louis. I mean, that Cardinal team, you know, look at the corners. You've got Paul Goldschmidt at first now, the former Diamondback. You've got Arenado, the former Rocky, at third. Oh, by the way, the Cardinals uh, received $51 million from the Rockies to have Arenado play for him. them. <laughs> Franchise is a disaster. Um, you, you, you think about the best fielding players in the game, he might be the best. You know he he and if he's not the best, he's in the in the top 
two or three. Um, and, he, and he hits for average and power. He was down with batting average, you know, last year and, and the like, but I think he's going to rebound. I expect a huge year from him. He's leaving a, 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 a bumbling franchise. He's going to a trademark franchise. Uh, he thought he was going to be a career Rocky. He thought he was going to be the face of the team. He bought into ownership and bought into the front office moves, and now they've traded him. Uh, after they didn't build around him, the organization lied to him. That's why, again, in Major League Baseball, and, and this is a whole podcast for another day, but let me just say this quick. In Major League Baseball, if you're looking for a side, the owners or the players, don't hesitate. It's always the players. <laughs> you know, the owners and the G, the, 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 these guys, the owners are, are crooks. And I know that these players are getting paid handsomely. I know that they're getting eight, you know, first class flights and equipment and they're getting paid to wear certain things and they're making tens upon ten you know tens of millions of dollars a lot of these guys are making like you know 900 grand a game I, I get that the players are just fine as well they're sitting on a nice soft pillow but when it comes down to relationships and it comes down to the actual handling of each other and the team and the sport and the dynamic the owners are a disgrace and Arenado, you know, they didn't build around him. And now they're not going to extend Trevor's story. And now Nolan Arenado is off to St. Louis. I think he's going to do great there. I think he's a top 10 player in the game. I think that's what the cards got. Great third baseman, amazing glove, building a Hall of Fame career. I've got him at number 10. Number 9, I've got the new New York Met in Francisco Lindor. And here's where Lindor edged out a LeMahieu. Arenado edged out a LeMahieu just because I think he's so superior with the gloves. And that says something. LeMahieu's a vacuum cleaner. Arenado's even up a step or two from that. Lindor is a wizard with the glove. He plays the most demanding position in baseball, arguably. The other one might be center field. I still go short. Well, I go catcher, shortstop, center field, you know, building right up the middle. One of the top three demanding positions in the sport. LeMahieu plays first, second, you know, can, can, you can move him around a little bit, but shortstop is, you know, you're really a signal caller working in with the catcher. You see the signs. It's a demanding position. You got to guard the middle. Lindor is not only great with the glove, but he's a switch hitter, right? Hits for average, hits for power. That switch hitter part is a big deal. Uh, that's where like the Mantle Maze thing, you know, I always kind of lean towards Mantle over Maze, not just with the great years of Mantle, uh, both of them in their prime. I know Willie probably had the, the best all around game for the duration of a career, but if you had to split hairs, I mean, Mantle did it from both sides of the plate. I mean, how many people have done that in the history of the game? Lindor's doing it now, and he's going to add a ton to the New York Mets. And so Lindor's in there at number nine, one of the great smiles in sports as well. Freddie Freeman, who's building a Hall of Fame of career in Atlanta, is just a guy you can count on, right? And by the way, all these guys here in the top 10, for the most part, are clutch during the regular season. And if they've had a moment in the postseason, most moments in the postseason, they have delivered there as well. Freddie Freeman's just a clutch ball player. You know, Freddie Freeman's up two outs, two on, bang, he gets a big hit. Awesome with the glove, super team leader. And, and you know, there's a couple of intangible things outside of just being a great player that I would throw, you know, in, in, onto the resumes of these players um, as well. And, and Freeman being a leader would be one of those guys. Alex Bregman comes in. Next, and, and I think that Alex Bregman is going to win the MVP this year. That that was my pick. Uh, I got him in at, at number at number seven. Um, I think he is now uh, the best player on the Houston Astros. George Springer's in Toronto. El Tuve dipped a little bit after the can banging. Um, I think Bregman's unbelievable. I really do. I know they have Correa still, too. But I think Bregman's the best of the bunch. Um, I think he's going to be challenging for batting titles and MVPs for a long time. Um, again, just an all-around balanced, versatile player. All these guys have balance, versatility, right? They hit for average and power. They're slick with the glove. I mean, they've got it all. And in today's game, you got to have it all. Number six is the $340 million man over 14 years, the newly minted contract Fernando Tatis. If you imagine being 20, you know, in your early 20s, living in San Diego, super good looking, super cool, dreadlocks, arguably the new face of the game, $340 million to your name, I mean, that's a pretty good life. And this guy just reeks excitement. He's flamboyant and fun and aggressive, and he takes chances. He's a fantastic fielder. It's short. 
he jumps up in the air and snags every ball. He gets out, you know, he gets him in the air. He gets him out and land, you know, uh, and he obviously just hits the snot out of the ball. Again, average in power, versatility, balanced. And he's the face now of that Padre organization. I got Cody Bellinger at number five. Um, you know, tail off a little bit, you know, kind of a roller coaster 2020 year, but still the best player on the LA Dodgers, in my opinion. Um, before they signed Mookie Betts. <laughs> Um, and Betts is, is way high on this list. We'll get to him in a minute. Um, I just think Bellinger, again, the clutch part, you can count on him. Great fielder, uh, hits lefties and righties, you know, like there isn't a pitch that you can kind of sneak past him. Uh, he works into a great count. I got Bellinger at number five. I got Juan Soto number four. Speaking of guys who work themselves into an awesome count, you could argue right now that Juan Soto is the best hitter and has the best eye in the game. Uh, The unquestioned best player on the Washington Nationals right now. A huge part of the Washington Nationals World Series run. They've got a great core there with Trey Turner, who I saw come up through the minor leagues. Victor Robles, who I saw come up through the minor leagues with the Syracuse Chiefs. This guy, Ronald, or uh, uh, this guy, Juan Soto, I'm getting ahead of myself, by the way. Uh, Juan Soto is everything you want in a hitter. And then he's got the glove, super young. All these guys, by the way, are really good base runners. I got Juan Soto at number four. Number three, I got Ronald Acuna Jr., who I think is, and how many guys do we have as five-tool players on this list? I mean, true five-tool players, which is at least you got to like check the good category in every box of, Hitting for average power, right? Fielding, throwing, and running. You got to be at least good at all of them. And then, you know, in other categories, you know, you're great or elite. I think I'd take Arenado out, Lindor out because of the base running thing. I think they're they're probably average base runners, right? Well, maybe not. Well, Lindor, no, Lindor's a good base runner. Arenado, Freeman I would take out, right? I don't think he's a good base runner. He's probably an average base runner. True five-tool players. I think Bregman, Tatis, Bellinger, Soto, Acuna. You know, probably all of the guys so far are five-tool guys outside of Arenado. Acuna is is great at everything as a five-tool player. And I think he's going to win multiple MVPs before his time is up. I got Acuna number three. I got the Braves winning the World Series. Uh, I think he is... He, he just strikes fear into, into pitchers. He strikes fear into managers when, you know, they're looking at lineups... I got Okuna at number three. I think he's probably the most exciting player in baseball. You know, if you had to put together the most exciting list, I'd probably put him behind maybe a a, a Mookie Betts and a Tatis at this particular point. Moving on up to number two and one, I think you could flip-flop these guys all day long. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who think that I just want to go for the new ice cream, right? It's like, how could you ever, you know, uh, uh, not take Mike Trout as the best player in in, in the game, right? How could you ever, how could you ever do that, right? And and I'm going on like this second, like this absolute minute, right? Mike Trout obviously is amazing. I mean, the guy's already got three MVPs and a rookie of the year and he's, you know, he's 28 years old. I don't know if he'll ever get to the playoffs, but... He's a hell of a player. His numbers are are just outrageous for his career. I mean, they're just, they're outrageous. He's already in the 300 home run club. He's already in the 1300 hit category. His OBP career is well over 400. His slugging is 582. He has an 1,000 OPS even. He's a two-time All-Star MVP, three-time. He could retire today and just walk right in as a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, it's, right now what he's done is Kofaxian, you know, to a certain degree. And, and he's absolutely phenomenal. Great fielder, ultimate five-tool guy. Don't argue any of that. And again, you could flip the coin between him and my number one, Mookie Betts. I got Mookie Betts number one. And I split a hair here, and here's why. Again, this is a here and now moment. This is a here and now, what have, you know, what's the guy about now and the absolute most recent things that we've seen. And what I've seen Mookie Betts do... And again, I, even though it's not career, you know, 
career accolades, but the guy also has already won two World Series, four Silver Sluggers, batting title, five Gold Gloves, four-time All-Star, ML uh, uh, play, a Player of the Year, and an MVP. <laughs> That's what he's done. Mookie Betts is an absolute all-around five-tool guy. I think he's more of a five-tool player than Trout, and here's why. Both guys hit for average and power, that goes without saying. Trout obviously has more power overall than Betts. He's got double the amount of home runs uh, than Betts so far, right? And Betts and Trout are about the same age. Betts is 27. But Mookie Betts, you know, the hitting for average, hitting for power... Mookie Betts, I think, has a little bit better of an arm than Mike Trout, actually. A little bit better of an arm. Okay? With the glove, I think they're both pretty even, right field, center field. Trout makes more of those over-the-wall catches. Betts makes more catches running in and in the gaps. Where I split a hair and say that Betts is a slightly better 5 tool player is I think he's a superior base runner. Trout's a great base runner, don't get me wrong. But I think Betts is a superior base runner overall and makes people miss where he is. He changes the game when he's on the base pass. And oh, by the way, this is going on during an analytical world where teams, managers, GMs, etc., front offices, the Dork Caves, they're supposed to take away the stolen base. Mookie Betts stole four bases in the World Series. Four of them. Okay, Mookie Betts changed the game time and time again against the Rays in the World Series. He is a difference maker on the base pass. Mookie Betts is also a postseason representative. He's been in the playoffs one, two, three, four, five years, most recently in 2020 with the L.A. Dodgers. The L.A. Dodgers hadn't won a World Series. They had another great team. Without Mookie Betts, they probably would have been picked to go there again and picked to win it, finally getting over the hump. But how did they ultimately get over the hump? Even with that grand payroll, even with all the players they already had, they get Mookie Betts, they won the World Series. It was almost like a Kevin Durant effect in Golden State. Like, oh, you guys are really, really good? Yeah, you're great. In the Warriors' case, they had already won. But do you want to, like, become dynastic? Well, get Durant. Well, Dodgers, want to finally win one? Here's Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts was unbelievable. 429 in the uh, NL wild card. 333 in the L, in the DS. 269 in the CS. 269 in the World Series. Hit a couple of home runs. He had 8 RBI. Right? He had 25 hits. His OBP, 500, 400, right? In a couple of those series. His OPS against the Brewers was 1,300 plus. This guy is absurd. He's unbelievable. I think he's the greatest five-tool player out there because his base running makes the other team shake. I got him a smidge ahead of Trout. I just explained why everybody else is where they are. Betts, Trout, Okunia, Soto, Bellinger, Tatis, Bregman, Freeman, Lindor, Arenado, and just outside my one-two, I've got DJ LeMahieu and Kristen Yelich. Super fun to put that list together. Thanks for listening to the ML Sports Platter. A huge tip of the cap. Thank you as well to Ryan Leaf for jumping on the program. Awesome to chat with him. His story is great. Go support him on his website and on Twitter, of course. Um, Really, really great stuff. Helping out folks and telling his story every single day. ML Sports Platter brought to you by Axe Exotic Pets, Rosie's Corner, Camillus Golf Club, Ken's Auto Detailing, and Bryant and Stratton College. For every and in life, Bryant and Stratton College. Two and four-year degrees apply now. Classes start soon. Bryant and Stratton College. Two awesome locations in central New York. If you're in the greater New York State area, you want to stay kind of at home or remotely close for a couple of hours away, I tell you, go to Bryant and Stratton College in central New York. Great stuff. James Street and in Liverpool, they just added a nursing program as well. Bryant and Stratton College is a proud ML Sports Platter sponsor. Hit me on Twitter, at Mike L Sports. Download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review for this podcast everywhere you get your podcasts. And as I always tell you, enjoy the games.